So, uh, I mean, it's uh, near to 11 inches as possible. We're going to be uh, having a, a moment of quiet to remember. Uh, entirely appropriate to write for today. Uh, I'm just going to introduce that, uh, really, that whole concept, and then I'm going to show you a short video before we do that. Um, CPM, a ministry that I work uh, with, uh, we produced a video for the centenary commemorations of World War One. It's a pack that churches have used. And, uh, we filmed some quite poignant things, a hundred years since the start of World War One. Uh, it's quite something really. You know, the war that was meant to be the war to end all wars, you know, it clearly didn't happen. Uh, there's never been a time really when the world's not been in some form of conflict, you know, almost in every continent at the moment too. And I was just uh, thinking this week, it's a strange thing, I, I've been travelling around the country again as usual, and uh, I was coming back from Watford on Saturday morning, and um, I was with uh, uh, my colleague, and I just um, just had this moment where I remembered uh, Karen's granddad, and he had been a, an RF regiment guy in World War II, and he was one of these guys, you know, where um, and they didn't really talk about the war, and one day I was having a cup of tea with him, uh, and he just happened to mention that he never, he never claimed his medals. He had, about, he had a few medals owed to him for different campaigns he'd been involved in. So I sneakily got his uh, service number and I wrote a letter, and just a little handwritten letter to the, the medals office. And he said, um, Sergeant John Kemp, service number blah blah blah, I believe maybe owed some medals. Could you write back to me and let me know if he is or not? And two weeks later, a box came through the place with four medals. I couldn't believe it. So we, we gathered him in, in a, he always used to go around for Sunday lunch. He's, he's, he's not with us anymore, but he, he, he always used to come around for Sunday lunch to my mother-in-law's. And at two o'clock in the afternoon, everyone was there. We gathered the whole family in. And uh, we sat him down and we said, thank you, John. You know, gave him the medals. It was just an amazing moment, actually. And, uh, Really poignant. Which, uh, so I was driving back from Watford, and I was saying to someone earlier, I'm not actually a very emotional person, but every now and again, it's very And it, And it, 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 I've got this massive lump in my throat, and you can tell I'm feeling it now. Because you know, the, the price that people paid so that we can do stuff like this, so five, six years of his life, committed to fighting, you know. And he's just a peaceable chap, really. And, and, and just standing with him on that day, you could see it just meant so much. It means so many years have passed, yet it, it meant so much. And in a minute, we're going to remember. So, on that note, the, the kids' church is going to be next door. So, I'm going to give the, the queue branch at the back time to get a little video queued up. So, if the kids want to go to their classes, we've got the creche, we've got kids' church, we've got a roller coaster set up next door for you, and everything. So, we're going to love it. So, uh, do, do your head that way if that's for you. And then, uh, just when the guys are ready, we're going to show you a little uh, video. And then uh, we'll have a moment of silence after so we reflect. I'm, I'm, we produce this just to help churches reflect on the nature of conflict and remembering and sacrifice. So we're going to look at something that we believe the Bible's got to say to us about that today. During World War I, nearly 900,000 soldiers and 100,000 civilians lost their lives. That's a staggering and horrific 2.19% of the British population at that time. And many more were wounded, often severely. Here in Ypres, one third of the total military losses occurred. And 90,000 of them have no known graves. And so in 1927, a memorial was opened at the Menin Gate as an expression of gratitude by the Belgian population 
for the sacrifices that were made for their freedom. On the first night that the memorial was opened, the last post was played as a sign of respect and honour. Since then, something remarkable has happened. Every night at 8pm, a small group of men from the local fire brigade close the road and sound the last post. Remarkably, they haven't missed a night since the 28th of July, 1928. In fact, during the Second World War, when Belgium was occupied, the last post ceremony was conducted instead in Surrey. But, as soon as Polish forces liberated Ypres in the Second World War, the ceremony resumed, even though there was heavy fighting taking place in other parts of the city. For the population of Ypres, it was important to remember the huge price that soldiers paid to bring them freedom. The Ypres salient is famous not just for the brutality of the fighting, but also for an unassuming Anglican clergyman called Geoffrey Ancatel Studdart Kennedy, and you probably know him better as Woodbine Willie. So called for his habit of dishing out Woodbine cigarettes to the wounded and dying on the battlefield, as well as prayer and spiritual guidance. The seventh of nine children hailing from Leeds, he was a vicar in Worcester when the war broke out. Quickly volunteering, he found himself on the Western Front, and not shying away from danger, he was often operating in no man's land, armed only with his Bible and cigarettes, and he would fearlessly minister to the soldiers. One celebrated story tells of him crawling out to a working party, putting up wire in front of their trench. A nervous soldier challenged him, asking who he was, and he said, The Church. When a soldier asked what the Church was doing out there, he replied, It's Job. In fact, he was awarded the Military Cross at the Battle of Messonine Ridge for running repeatedly into no man's land to help the wounded. The citation said this, For conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty, he showed the greatest courage and disregard for his own safety in attending to the wounded under heavy fire. He searched shell holes for our own and enemy wounded, assisting them to the dressing station and his cheerfulness and endurance had a splendid effect upon all ranks in the frontline trenches, which he constantly visited. After the war, he became closely involved in the Christian Socialist and the Pacifist movements, touring the country giving public lectures. He was in Liverpool on one of his lecture tours in 1929, when he fell ill and died. A crowd of more than 2,000 turned out for his funeral procession, lining from Worcester Cathedral to his old parish church of St Paul. They tossed packets of woodbines onto the passing cortege, a gesture the Reverend Stoddart Kennedy would probably have thoroughly approved of, being a heavy smoker himself. Woodbine Willie was a man who was prepared to put his own life on the line. Motivated by God's love and the message of Jesus, he was prepared to lose his life to bring life to others. Two thousand years ago, Jesus did give up his life for the human race. It was the ultimate sacrifice. The Bible says that no greater love is there than this, that a man gives up his life for his friends. The Bible also gives us a future hope that one day there will be no more war and no more brutality. As we remember those who paid the price 100 years ago during the centenary commemorations, Let's also remember this promise from the Bible. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. 
the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So I, you know, coming back from Watford, happily chatting away with my colleague and suddenly finding myself with a big lump in my throat. You know, you think, it, 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 it's amazing how these things grab you unexpectedly. So, uh, you know, I'd been thinking during the week while I was zipping around, thinking, uh, how do you provide an appropriate biblical reflection on something like Remembrance Day? Um, and then just, you know, I gave me some thoughts that are being crystallised in my head. And, uh, and then just driving back, uh, it kind of hit me really. And I thought, well, you know, people in the Christian church, they have mixed feelings about war. And some people have very strongly pacifist views. Some people uh, have a, you know, a more a view where they say, well, sometimes war is necessary. But I just started thinking a little bit back from that really. Uh, and I was pondering on, on the nature of the gospel, you know, the, the good news that we communicate, the message of Jesus Christ. And, and I've been hearing something lately. Um, when I've been listening at conferences or reading certain books, I've been noticing a change in the way that people preach about Jesus Christ and they communicate the Christian faith. And it's a subtle one. And it goes something like this. Um, Jesus died to pay the price for us. So if we, if we follow Jesus, and if we follow his teachings, and if we choose to live a different way in community, and we meet the needs of the community, and we do good things, and we lead good lives, then the world will change. Now, that's kind of okay, but it's actually not the full story. What they're saying is, and this is a word we don't use very often, what they're saying is that evil is, is out there. And if we live our lives differently, we can change the world and we can deal with evil. But what that doesn't do is recognise that actually evil is in us. He says it's out there, but it's not. It's in us. And the reason that wars happen, and stuff happens, and violence happens, and crime happens, and fraud happens, and Nick in the pick and mix at Walrus when it existed happens, is because it's in us. And I know some of you did that, and that's prophetic. It's in us. That's the thing. You know, pride is us. Selfishness is us. So I started to think a little bit back, uh, you know, from remembrance and thinking, yeah, okay, so how do I live my life in such a way that honours what Jesus did? How do I live my life in such a way that honours the freedom that some people paid the price for, humanly speaking, for, for us to live in the way that we do today? How do I, how do I live in response to that? And so actually... Um, I was obviously thinking about the scriptures around the Isaiah passage that we had read out uh, very beautifully at the end by, we thought we'd use a professional actress because my voice is so rough when he did a balance on the video. But it was read beautifully, wasn't it? I thought, well, actually, let's, let's even dig further behind that. And, and so my mind and heart, as I prayed, went to the Beatitudes. Uh, and, and particularly uh, Matthew 5, uh, verse 9 which is blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. I thought, well, for us to honour what Jesus has done for us, for us to honour the memory of what people have done for us, we live our lives a different way. We recognise that evil is in us, that Jesus paid the price for us, and so in response, because Jesus loves me, I live my life a different way. Now, to get very technical about it, there's a little Greek word. I don't know much Greek. When I was at uh, Spurgeon's College many years ago, I had the option of doing Greek, but I couldn't get much past Don Kebab, and I found out that was Turkish, <laughs> so it was even Greek. Uh, but there is uh, a very fascinating Greek word around the word blessed, 
Do you know all the Beatitudes start with the word blessed? Blessed are you, blessed are you. So when you dig into what that word blessed means, the Greek word is makarios. You can make sure the things like hey, makarios, makarios. <laughs> it's makarios. And makarios, it actually was a word that they used to attribute to the characteristics of gods. Gods had makarios. They were supremely blessed. They were abundantly prosperous. They had absolutely everything. Materially, they had everything. They were untouchable because they had so much. But then Jesus used that word to describe what it meant to be a follower of him and to live a kingdom lifestyle. Now, clearly he's not saying you're going to be blessed like a god. He's saying Macarius in him is in terms of spiritual prosperity. He's not saying, you know, if you live like this, you're going to get a white Mercedes. He's saying if you live like this, then you will please your Father in heaven. And you live the Jesus way by living in a very counterintuitive way. So, you know, the world seems to have the language of complaint. I mean, you stand in a queue at Tesco and you're listening on conversations, or maybe at Quick Fit, especially Quick Fit, people <coughs> tend to be moaning a little bit. The language of the world is a little bit miserable. You watch a soap opera, they are not filled with abundant joy, <laughs> are they? I don't know if you ever watched a soap opera, I try to avoid them, but my recollection of EastEnders is it's mostly built on gossip, rumour, myth, and having a go about each other. The world doesn't do joy very easily. But the countercultural way to do it, if the world's language is complaint, we use joy. If the world's language is deceit, well, our language and demeanour is truthfulness. And so the Beatitudes, in order to be abundantly blessed inside, you know, to, to have peace, uh, wholeness, uh, God's shalom, you know, peace in every sense, we live life a different way. So when you read them through, each one of these Beatitudes is very demanding. But then we've got this thing, blessed are the peacemakers, not peacekeepers, blessed are the peacemakers. So I just thought, for a few minutes, let's have a little think on Remembrance Day of what it means to be someone who leads a peacemaking life. Just for a few minutes, just as a reflection. You know, what, what if we all made a decision today, or well, those of us who could, to say, you know, for the rest of my days, as long as I've got strength, I'll live my life in a counterintuitive way and bring peace. I'll be, I'll be a man or woman of peace. I think it would be an entirely appropriate response to following Jesus Christ. Not only that, it's quite biblical. But then you think, well, what does that mean? So, in order to flesh this out, I'm going to tell you a couple of illustrations, things that might help us. Uh, one guy um, we used to live next door to uh, a few years ago when we were in Bath, um, I would suggest, I would suggest he, was, uh, he was a little bit miserable. He was a bit of a, he was a bit of a moaner. He's the kind of guy that, you know, if your fence was leaning over slightly into his land, you would know about it ten seconds after that happened. <laughs> you know, if your car was slightly infringing on his property, you would know about it. And, and I made a fatal mistake with this guy. I decided uh, when we moved into our house that, you know, I think a good kingdom principle is always try and leave things better than you found them. So we've always tried to, you know, uh, try and improve a house you've been in or improve an organisation we're working in or, you know, you just leave things better than you found them. So I made the mistake of actually deciding to do stuff to my garden without consulting my neighbour. So I didn't realise you actually needed permission to work in your own garden, but apparently you did. <laughs> and one of the things I did at the back of our garden was to put a patio in and, and uh, a, a vegetable little thing, which actually we never used, so it became a weed patch, and um, like a pergola structure. Uh, I was away as usual, zipping around the country, and long story short, uh, came back home to Karen saying, um, you know, the, the neighbour is on the verge, basically, of, of knifing you. You know, he's not, he's not very happy. I said, well, about what? He said, about the um, pergola thing we we're building out the back of the garden. So, you have a choice in these situations, don't you? I mean, people don't deal with neighbourhood disputes very well, by and large. You know, uh, classic disputes over where does my fence go? Your fence is one inch into my garden. You know, people get very territorial in the UK about that, but I just decided to knock on his door, and um, I, I had the intention actually of taking him out a box of chocolates or something, but I don't think I did. But I had the intention, I had the intention, and that, that means a lot, doesn't it? The intention to do something. 
Uh, but I, I knocked on his door, and you know what it's like in these moments? It's always actually quite stressful to, to confront somebody who hates you, you know, with all their strength. Uh, so I just knocked on his door, and as soon as he opened his door and saw me, he went through it. I mean, you're building a garage! <laughs> As a burglar, you know, you're the, your car does this, and you're the, and there's one, and it's getting more and more intense in my face. So I looked at him, and then you've got a choice. You know what it's like. You, you have read this thing called our human nature. Evil is in us. You know, and I'm, I'm relatively eloquent, and in my head, I'm constructing arguments that will destroy him, <laughs> leave him on the floor, you know. I mean, I've just got to get a grip, haven't you? Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are you when people persecute you or force yourself kinds of things. Mm. That's the countercultural way to live. That's the kingdom way. So I just looked at him. I mean, it's really in my face, this old boy. I looked at him and I said, Are you okay at the moment? How are you doing? How's life? And he went, Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> I went, Why is that? He said, Oh, my wife's just gone in the hospital. I know it is. My heart's palpitating. I always want. So why don't we just sit down and have a little chat about it? And we end up having a, a lovely little chat about the state of play and, um, you know, and try to bless him a little bit. And then I said, It's not a garage, by the way, it's a burglar, and I'm going to grow roses up it and all stuff like that. He went, Oh, that'd be lovely. So we had to sit out of my window. I said, Any time you've got a concern, just got to knock on the door. Be absolutely fine. And that whole situation went back from, you know, DEFCON 1, nuclear launch, <laughs> back to, you know, we were kind of at peace with each other. Almost like that. Just by having that countercultural response. Blessed are the peacemakers. But sometimes it's even worse than that. Now, some of you will know this, that, uh, and some of you might have heard me talk about this, but I, for the last 18 months, have had the immense privilege of driving a Toyota GT86, which is a sports car. Because it was the evangelistic project. Because we learned that William Booth bought uh, four Model Bs in 1904. He spent £250,000 on four Model Bs. Did you know that? William Booth? Founded the Salvation Army. Spent £250,000 on a load of four Model Bs. Four of them, a quarter of the global stock, just because he knew he'd draw a crowd of fellas if he drove around the country. He'd stand in the back and preach a gospel. I've got a picture of it. Absolutely amazing. Don't you think? Use all means. That's why we've just set up a Ferrari fund at CVM. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we've been having this evangelistic project. Uh, ten months ago, I was driving down um, Slack Lane. Uh, it was dark, it was wet, it was raining, it's my excuse. I was in five miles an hour in the queue of traffic, and um, the car in front moved off. I looked out the window at the houses that were being, being built to the right at that time, and at five miles an hour, um, accidentally drove into the back of the car, because in front, because uh, the lady who was driving the car stopped, I would argue, for no reason. <laughs> so um, she was driving a 1989 Vauxhall Nova, <laughs> which I calculate was worth about 200 quid. Uh, my car was quite low slung, uh, and so it went under the bumper. The bumper is built something like a chieftain tank, so it went under the bumper and um, sort of slightly wedged there. So we sort of got out of our cars, I looked to the window and I said, Merry Christmas. Sorry about that. Did you see this number? And um, she went, what did you do that for? I said, well, I wasn't looking and you stopped. So it's called an accident. You know, I just, <laughs> just drove it to the back of you. So I said, should we have a look at the cars? She went, it's raining and dark. So I put the torch on the iPhone, had a look at it. Her car is old and it's got this huge big rubber bumper. And it's all marked up from years of use. And, and, and I said, is there any damage? Have I caused any damage on your car? Because my bumper is actually sort of underneath her one, really. And she said, no. I said, it was such a slow accident, I think my car's fine. I said, will you confirm it? She said, yeah. She said, my car's absolutely fine. She said, yours isn't, though, is it? Because my car's got a high-tech system that a 1989 Vauxhall Nova doesn't have called a crumple zone. So the front of my car looked like a pterodactyl. So it's not in good shape. It's all folded up and wrinkly. So we swapped details anyway, just in case. Long story short, drove home, said to Karen, hi, uh, home, crash the car again. <laughs> okay. So um, get it sorted, no problem. Uh, this woman had agreed there's no damage. Long story short, two weeks later, I get a text message. I get a text message. I've had my car independently assessed by a mechanic. And there's over £600 worth of damage. But if you give me a cheque for £100, I'll forget all about it. 
You know what's happening, don't you? She's trying to steal from it. Because there was no damage. It's a five mile an hour crash. I hit her with a plastic bumper. It's a five mile an hour crash. There's no damage to her car. I know she's trying to steal from it. And like, you get all these kind of reactions up inside. But blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are you when people do this and you don't respond like that. That's the counterculture way to live. So, I had to make an executive decision because Karen wasn't about. So I sent her a text and I said, where do you live? Not so I could fire bomb the house. <laughs> so where do you live? I'll come and drop a check round. So she replied immediately, told me she did. And I drove round there with a pterodactyl. And I wrote her a check for £150. My checkbook says Reverend Carl Beach on it. So I'm a proper ordained clergyman and everything. And that's a shock to somebody. The Bible quotes everything. It says Reverend Carl Beach. So I knock on the door. I hand her the check. I said, I put a little bit more on there because I want to bless you. I said, what? I said, I want to bless you. I said, what do you mean bless me? I said, well, I'll just try and live my life a little bit differently. And um, here's the check. Inside at that moment, I wanted to say something like, and if you steal from a man of God, you could be struck down dead. <laughs> Don't do this. This is very dangerous. Don't do this. There's stories in the Bible. I've got your story. That's what I'm going to say. Inside, I'm thinking, yeah, let's, let's, let's have a go here. Blessed and peace, man. 150 quid. Now at Christmas, an unexpected check for 150 quid. That does hurt you a little bit. That's not an easy thing to do, especially when you know you're being ripped off. But also inside I'm thinking, I bet she's so perplexed. I bet she so wants this blessing that I'm offering that she doesn't cast the check. By my calculations, she must have gone to the bank that afternoon to clear about three days later. <laughs> but it was worth the risk, wasn't it? Don't you think? It's worth the risk. Because here's my thinking. What if, three years' time, she's been bumping into Christians every now and again? And she gets invited on an Alpha course, or Christianity Explorer or something. And they're talking about being blessed and being peace and grace and all that stuff and love and how Christians love. And she remembers that there is this clergyman bloke who fought back and had a go at her for trying to, you know, steal from him. Now, well, that's not going to go down very well. But what if in a few years' time she's doing a Christianity Explorer or an Alpha course and she remembers that story of that bloke who she tried to steal from. But he didn't just give her what he asked for, he gave her a little bit more. That could be the road to her meeting Jesus Christ, couldn't it? Not only that, this is what I found. If you live your life seeking to be a peacemaker, you are pursuing this you know, macarious lifestyle, which is painful and difficult at times, you actually, despite the human sense of cost, that that sometimes brings, you're actually more at peace yourself. That's the irony. The more you seek to be a peacemaker, the more you'll be a person of peace and at peace yourself. That is just a fact. It may hurt and it may cost, but you'll be more at peace. They say that if you, someone once said, if you harbour bitterness or unforgiveness, in your head about someone else. All you are doing is giving that person free rent space in your head. And what do you want to do that for? The second thing is though, that living that way I think is a supremely, you know, powerful way of honouring what Jesus has done for us. If we truly believe that Jesus has died for us to deal with evil within us, if we truly believe that he was nailed to a lump of wood for us, then the least that we could do is swallow our pride sometimes, isn't it? And the least we could do is seek to bless people. The least we could seek to do is be people who bring peace and joy into other people's lives, living this countercultural lifestyle. That's what I think anyway. I think that is a path for inner peace for us, and I think it just pleases God, which is why uh, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Now you may think, well, Carl, that's great. Um, there's two things, really. You know, I, I come to church and I want really deep theology. I want some really deep teaching. Well, here's the deep teaching. Love people. Bless people. Bless those who persecute you. 
Don't fight back. Someone wants an inch of your garden, give them two inches. Someone moans about you, about where you're parking your car, park somewhere else. If you say, well, you're teaching me to be a doormat, okay, be a doormat. Confuse people. A, a, a statement I use all the time. Live in such a way that you are placing a stone in someone's shoe. You've heard me say, live differently. Countercultural. Bless the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Bless the meek. Bless the those who are hungry and thirst for righteousness. Bless the merciful. Bless the pure in heart. Bless the peacemakers. Bless the those who are persecuted. Macarius, this incredible sense of joy. If I could give you a phrase, it would help us. Be a person who crosses the room to the other person. Now, metaphorically speaking, there's someone you don't like, you be the person to cross the room to them and hold your hand out to them. That takes a lot of guts. That takes a lot of strength. Do you know what? Even in a gathering this size, there can be someone in this room you feel a little bit chippy about. Dan's nodding at me, he's feeling chippy at me. <laughs> Cross the room to him. Hold out your hand. Pray for him. Because it will do something to you. I think on Remembrance Sunday, that would be an entirely appropriate way for us to live. Or at least an entirely appropriate way for us to respond. Now, just to bring some balance to this, I know that there are sometimes huge injustices that are perpetrated upon us, and sometimes things need to be taken a little bit further. You, know, you can't be a doormat in every single situation. I understand that. But in a rough and tumble of daily life, when someone's you know, upset you or hurt you, be the person that crosses them. If we need to be taken a stage further, except legal issues, I'm not saying we never go to the police, we never deal with things. I'm not saying that. I'm saying in the interactions of our daily lives. Now, being a peacemaker by nature costs. And mostly it costs our pride. And our sort of insecurities. So why don't we, uh, why don't we spend just a moment thinking about that? We could ask the Holy Spirit to show us. Where is it you're asking me to bring peace? Is it in my work situation? Are there colleagues who are rubbing up against each other in the wrong way? Is there a way I need to stand in the gap? Do I need to be prepared to be unpopular with some people to preach the gap a little bit for people? Do I need to stand in the way of an injustice? You know, do I need to swallow my pride and actually cross the room to someone? Do I need to meet, uh, you know, being ripped off with extreme generosity? Is there a way that I've got to live a different way? Do I need to just let some things go? Uh, just speaking with someone earlier, a phrase, another phrase I often use, I find really helpful. Sometimes when there's an injustice against me, I'd say, well, I'll give it to heaven. Heaven will decide. Someone says something false about you, or that's a bit of gossip, or someone's trying to steal from you in whatever way, emotionally or physically, I'll just say to them, well, I'll give it over to heaven. Heaven will decide. And that has the added bonus of really unnerving people when you say that as well, because <laughs> that's a bit scary, isn't it? But let's be quiet for a moment and just think on that. Guys will come up and uh, lead us in some worship to help us reflect.